Welcome back. Our next speaker is Professor Maria K. Hill, who did her doctorate on, uh, Helen, on Helen Hogg as a communicator of science. And she's actually writing a monograph on Helen Hogg, so, uh, I guess sort of a biography. Called through the or Helen Hogg through the lens, and that's all you've got to hear from me. And you saw how we got the image of the book in the program. Right? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you today. I'm really honored to be here today during this joint assembly of the RESC and the AVSO, two organizations that meant so much to Dr. Helen Hogg. And as an aside, over the many years in which I've researched her, I've seen more of the RAC photos of this assembly, and I'm dying to get in one finally. I just wanted to say that. Um, anyway, I research, speak, and write about Helen because I relate to her. Yes, her accomplishments, are impressive, but I relate to her because of her challenges and her dogged determination to do what she loved and was passionate about. I feel it's important to keep her story and her journey alive so that young people can learn from her and be encouraged to pursue their own dreams because they see the entire picture and not just the lists and lists and lists as you see of her accomplishments, which can be daunting. It's also important to acknowledge that she didn't succeed in a vacuum. There were many, some here in fact, who influenced her work and supported her over the years. Helen has been referred to as Canada's Grand Dame of Astronomy and the face of Canadian astronomy. Not only did she rise through the academic ranks at the University of Toronto and serve in positions of leadership in the AVSO and the RASC, but she was a science writer who reached out to students and the public through her Toronto Star newspaper column with the stars. She wrote The Stars Belong to Everyone, a book that speaks to a lay audience and she wrote, Out of Old Books, a column for the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Plus, she hosted a television show for TV Ontario called Astronomy. She delivered numerous speeches at scientific conferences, professional women's associations, school programs, libraries, and other venues. It's easy to look at Helen's life and take her accomplishments for granted, however, in the early 20th century, most women did not have the opportunity to attend college, and if they did, would often not have received support from their family. However, Helen's parents shared a fundamental belief in women's rights as well as an appreciation of nature. On regular walks along Lowell, Massachusetts waterways near their home, they nurtured within their daughter an appreciation of minerals, wildflowers, and the stars. And a college education for Helen was expected. Even though Helen's father passed away when she was 12, he made sure that his family was left financially secure so that nothing would stop his daughter from receiving her education or leave his family in jeopardy. As Helen entered Mount Holyoke, as a freshman chemistry major, she was only 16. She carried the love of nature that her parents had instilled within her, but she was also an avid reader of literature and had read the Bible many times, as well as Shakespeare and Thackeray. Therefore, she discovered to her delight that the Mount Holyoke Library was adjacent to the Williston Observatory and quickly she found her reading, herself reading many books on astronomy, as well as perusing the periodical Popular Astronomy, which she found intriguing. And as an aside, years later, Helen referenced her general education courses and talked about how they had influenced her writing and her development as a professional astronomer. However, at Mount Holyoke, Helen's interest in astronomy was solidified by Professor Dr. Ann Young, 
who arranged to take her astronomy students on a special train from Massachusetts to Connecticut to view the total eclipse of the sun. On January 24, 1925, the students stood with horribly cold feet, almost knee deep in the snow, and viewed the eclipse from the path of totality. Many years later, Helen explained that the glory of the spectacle seems to have tied me to astronomy for life. Thus, Helen's interest in and love of astronomy grew over time, but cemented itself on that auspicious day in 1925. Then only one year after the eclipse, Helen's life was permanently changed by meeting with Harvard, with, by meeting with Harvard astronomer Annie Jump Cannon. Annie visited Mount Holyoke and was so impressed with Helen, and shortly after their meeting, Cannon arranged for Helen to continue graduate studies under Harvard College Observatory Director Dr. Harlow Shapley. In September 1926, Helen arrived at the HCO to begin her as a research assistant as well as her graduate program. At the time, she was enrolled at Radcliffe College because women were not yet awarded degrees from Harvard in astronomy. However, most of her studies and her research was conducted under the purview of Dr. Harlow Shapley. On September 29th at 9 a.m., she arrived at the observatory ready for work. Right away, Helen met Shapley for her first of many discussions and learned that he wanted her to assist him on a book on star clusters. At the HCO, Helen was not surrounded just by male astronomers, but by female computers who, despite the overall lack of recognition, produced science. But she also worked side by side with other bright female graduate students, and of course the renowned Annie Cannon and the brilliant astronomer Dr. Cecilia Payne. At the HCO, women researched, women produced. They wrote articles and delivered papers. And it was Harvard where she met her first, well, her only husband, Frank Hogg, who had just graduated from the University of Toronto Math and Physics course with the RASC Gold Medal in Astronomy. So in September of 1926, he too arrived at the HCO, but he worked under Dr. Cecilia Payne. Then in 1929, he received the first official PhD in astronomy awarded by Harvard, but you can think about that irony there for a minute. Shortly after he entered his doctorate, he had uh, received the Parker Traveling Fellowship, and it took him to Europe for most of the year, and then he went to Mount Wilson Observatory for research. And the year Frank was absent was very tumultuous for Helen. Although Helen and Shapley's teacher-student relationship has started out very well, there were some significant bumps in the road before she graduated. In the year of Frank's absence, Helen became increasingly frustrated because she believed that what Shapley told her when she arrived about completing her thesis and her PhD had changed. Here, I will share some brief portions of a series of letters she wrote to Frank, with whom she became officially engaged April 1930. And I do think that the timing of this is important. These letters depict her growing frustrations with Shapley and graduate school. May 2nd, 1930. Dearest Frankie, I consider that the treatment of me at the Harvard Observatory during the past four years has been ruthless, dastardly and really criminal. I sweated blood last year and did a fine piece of work on cluster distances. Dr. Shapley never made a new observation and I did the bulk of the vital computing. It was my year's work and he spent two or three days on it. Nevertheless, he gets 100% of the credit. In other papers, it's always referred to as Shapley's new data. Well. I don't care particularly about that, but I do rebel at not getting credit for it at the OB. No one ever considers it as my work. And after I've worked like a dog there for three and a half years, I'm expected to start in and do a thesis. 
Then on June 10th, she wrote again to Frank, tonight I talked to Dr. Shapley and Mrs. Shapley for several hours, hours, who spent all of their time telling me that they felt sure I wouldn't really want to work for a PhD after I got married. Frankie, Angel, <laughs> have you ever in all your life heard anything so ghastly? I've published eight articles on a variety of subjects, and Dr. S knows that I've done 99% of the work on them. Women who began graduate work during Helen's time frequently graduated, but if they married, often did not ultimately pursue careers as astronomers, or if they did, they did so in much less prestigious positions that as of their scientist husbands. Dr. Cecilia Payne, who came to the HCO and graduated before Helen, was an exception, but then she completed her PhD and didn't get married until some time later and was well established. So the suggestions that Dr. and Mrs. Shapley made to Helen were almost expected, aside, of course, from promises of graduation that she felt he'd rendered. Although Helen was frustrated not receiving more credit for her work, it appears that everything had been moving very well for her until the marriage proposal or when they realized that they were really serious. And reviewing Helen's letters has made me wonder if Shapley put roadblocks before her simply because once she accepted the proposal, it seemed from his cultural perspective the right thing to do. But then sometimes I think maybe he didn't know her. He just put a firecracker under her and got her to push forward because it made her angry. Then, so she wrote to Frank next. <laughs> there are more letters. There's a ton of them. Um, Dr. Shapley sees in me a person who, as the wife of Professor Hogg at Harvard, is much more valuable to this honorable institution in a personal and social way than in a scientific way. He told me two days ago that for general all-around ability, I had it all over Mrs. Shapley. For public speaking, for poise, general social planning, etc. I was most outstanding. And he sees in me the perfect professor's wife. Oh, get ready, there's more. I'll run, I'll run, I'll run the Harvard end of the AAVSO gratis. I'll spend a year getting ready for the IU planning teas, dinner, gratis. I'll help my husband to the ninth degree astronomically, gratis. It's a noble scheme. Now, I can feel her anger, and from many letters I've read, although she was often shockingly honest with Dr. Shapley, I wish we had more time to go into some of those letters, but <laughs> there were some doozies. But he, you know, I just want to say, I think he very much, I think he, I think he deeply cared about her, and I think a lot of times he was talking to his students like his kids. And sometimes I felt like he was putting these roadblocks there just to see if they really wanted to do what they said they wanted to do. I'm not positive, and she wasn't either, but she eventually forgives him. But she regularly poured out her soul to Frank, who in many ways indeed was a saint, but that's another story too. So. Once Frank returned from his travel fellowship, he accepted a research appointment at Amherst and Helen accepted a position at Mount Holyoke while also completing coursework and her thesis. And there had been no projection she would get it done that fast, but she put fire under it and they married in September of 1930, life stabilized, she continued, and then June 31, she had it done. Just a couple of months prior to Frank accepting an offer from J.S. Plaskett, at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Victoria. Fortunately, Helen's relationship with Shapley did not end when she left the HCO, but it did take a well-needed break, mostly on her side. Now, another important figure appeared on the scene, J.S. Plaskett. Most certainly a sign of the era, just a few years earlier, astronomer Dr. Cecilia Payne had been rejected for the same position Frank was offered because J.S. Plaskett felt it would be inappropriate for a single woman to take such a position that required observing at night with most likely a male technician. As Helen's husband Frank was an automatic chaperone, thus Helen was able to observe. 
One thing a little bit funny about that is that though Frank did go with her a couple of times, most of the time he wasn't there because they would rotate. She would observe, he would observe, and so on. However, another roadblock for employment came from the Depression because in the 1930s, employing a married woman was considered unconscionable. So, but fortunately, when the couple arrived, they were greeted warmly by Dr. Plaskett and his wife, both of who, both whom came, became close friends with the younger couple. And although Helen worked as a volunteer at the DAO, she was allowed observing time and she was found, soon found herself peering through the DAO's 72-inch telescope, the largest in Canada at the time. Yet research was not Helen's and Frank's only concern. On June 20th, 1932, Helen gave birth to the hog's first child, Sally. The couple was thrilled to become parents and both mother and father actively participated in her care. Within five weeks, Helen resumed observing on July 27th. Most advantageous for Helen, as well as her new daughter, Sally, was the loving support provided by her husband, Frank, as well as the Plaskets. Then in the late winter, early spring of 1934, Frank received an invitation from Dr. Clarence Augustus Chant, head of the Department of Astronomy at the University of Toronto, to return to that university in 1935 as a faculty member of the department. Though an appealing offer, Helen and Frank hesitated leaving the DAO. Their years there were highly satisfying. They enjoyed the staff, they appreciated the Plaskets, and they felt part of a community, one that held satisfying work as well as a wholesome atmosphere in which to raise a family. However, an important consideration was also J.S. Plaskett's retirement in a few years. He had treated Frank and Helen well as researchers and extended family members in many ways. And Helen believed that when Plaskett retired that Harper, second only to Plaskett, would take over the director position, which is what happened, and that Harper's view of women was not equal to Plaskett's. According to Helen, Harper believes that girls are made to paint china delicately at home. Certainly, my future in Toronto is more cheerful. Still, there was a reluctance on Helen's and Frank's part to leave Victoria, but they could not turn down the honor of an appointment at the University of Toronto. Then early in 1935, shortly after Frank joined the faculty, Helen learned that Dr. Peter Millman wanted her to serve on the observatory committee of the RESC because he believed that she could create enthusiasm for variables. Even though Helen and Frank had attended RESC meetings in Victoria, this is when her close association with the society began. And although Helen first worked as a volunteer at the David Dunlap Observatory, the opportunity of paid employment arose quickly, and Chant hired her as a research assistant in 1936. But Dr. Chant didn't just offer Helen a paid job at the university. He was a driving force behind the RESC and editor of the journal for 50 years. Certainly, if not for Chant, it's unlikely Helen would become so invested in the RESC and become known for her writing. Chant strongly encouraged the University of Toronto astronomers to publish book reviews and other articles in the journal, which opened the door for Helen's Out of Old Books column, which ran from 46 to 66, thus finding her niche in science writing. In her first Old Books column in 1946, she stated that due to the loss of valuable texts in European libraries during World War II, she intended to publish from time to time extracts from old books which may be profitable and we hope interesting reading for the journal subscribers. Helen worked to reclaim significant historical astronomical information by introducing a current event and relating it to a past event of historic and astronomical value, employing a vivid writing style filled with, with detail, always taking care to appeal to the journal's wide variety of readers. In the late 30s through the 40s, even though Helen had a growing family, few professional opportunities escaped her. However, despite Helen's professional advancement through the years, she became exhausted and frustrated with her combined role of astronomer and parent and considered leaving the university and the work that she did love. 
she was a private person who did not openly share her friends, her fears or frustrations. However, she shared them with the two men she trusted, Frank and Harlow Shapley. Fortunately, Helen had successfully, successfully gained some perspective on those graduate years and reclaimed her relationship with her mentor. In a letter to Shapley on July 25, 1949, she wrote, all spring I felt very doleful. The night observing, which I have been tackling systematically, has served only to convince me that I cannot fit in night work with my heavy family responsibilities. In other words, I seem to have reached the end of my tether. I have asked Frank to get me an indefinite leave of absence from my university position here, but he's very much upset at the thought. Also, I've received a letter from the secretary of the AAS informing me of the Annie Jump Cannon Award. In my opinion, this award carries with it a certain amount of responsibility. In other words, it doesn't look so good to take the award and quit. Shapley responded immediately and said, there is little doubt, but what you're taking too much in running a family at this critical stage and doing everything else. A leave of absence from university work is obviously a good idea, but a study with astronomical literature in it and some photographs of clusters and the computing machine, that should not be given up, even if it must be established in one corner of some room at home. And also probably there's something interesting and not too laborious about writing about old books that should be done, just to keep the finger in the game until strength and time are less expensive. And about that award, don't be silly. The award is made for past accomplishments and carries with it no responsibility for future activities. Suppose I should commence turning in medals because I've degenerated into being just a blank, blank director, personality smoother, instigator of laborers by others. Let's both cheer up. I've convinced myself that this is unquestionably the best universe I know of. So Shapley and Frank helped Helen persevere through this difficult time. Her work didn't suffer, she did not quit. Over the next year and a half or so, Helen continued, unaware of how much worse life would become and very shortly. When Helen and Frank married, they knew he didn't have a normal life expectancy due to rheumatic fever he would had as a child that damaged his heart. However, they always focused on their growing family and their careers. Then on January 1st, 1951, the Hogg family was relaxing at home. It was a typical New Year's Day. Helen and Frank's now teenage children were present. After lunch, Frank went into the bedroom for an afternoon nap. Although he showed no signs of distress, he never awakened from his nap. Helen had always been a hard worker, but upon her husband's death, she threw herself into her work with terrific zeal. She was fearful that the Toronto Star would drop Frank's column with the stars, which he had written for 10 years. Even though the column was established, the agreement Frank had was freelance and it was week to week. Helen wanted to write the column because she loved writing, particularly for a lay audience, but also for the small income. Fortunately, she had authored out of old books for the journal five years prior to her husband's death and had on occasion filled in for Frank in writing his star column. So she had the needed experience. Nonetheless, there was no guarantee. In a grand show of support, members of the Toronto Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada sent a barrage of letters to the star requesting that Helen become colonist of With the Stars. And with only a week lag, Helen began writing the column on January 13, 1951. Despite some general challenges in writing a weekly column, Helen had the freedom to choose her own topics within, with minimal edits, the only prescription being describing the sky for that month. The RASC membership remained loyal readers over a 30-year period, and Helen gained an even broader spectrum of readers that included those who might not otherwise have been exposed to such easily accessible science. Even with the support of the RASC membership, as well as friends and family, the death of Frank, a heavy workload, and some health issues took a toll on Helen. And in the early to mid-1950s, she seriously considered once more leaving her beloved profession. Many times during this period, until his death in 1972, 
Helen wrote to her mentor and now friend, Harlow Shapley, seeking a sympathetic ear, and he did the same. And once again, Helen managed to move past her struggles. Then in 1976, The Stars Belong to Everyone was published. Some have stated that the RAC was not directly influential regarding Helen's premier astronomy text. However, Helen's dedication to astronomy education as well as her support of and by the RASC is evident. The title itself exemplifies the RASC's perspective and approach to astronomy education. And within the text itself, Helen recognizes and thanks the RASC for its ongoing support. However, similar to her star column, appreciation of Helen's book was not limited to society members. The Stars Belong to Everyone was adopted by some schools for their science classrooms and was read by others interested in learning about astronomy and in an engaging fashion. Helen drew some of her content and style from her popular column. Each chapter is introduced with a quote from music or literature that readers would have easily recognized at that time. Further, as with most of her work, Helen included historical information coupled with current events in order to make the content more relevant to the reader, always utilizing clear, direct language. Helen continued the writing style she had established in Out of Old Books and with the Stars. And I do want to mention too, Ellen received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters over the years from With the Stars, her book, Out of Old Books, and she answered each each and every one. And there were classroom teachers that were having their entire class write to her. And one time at the end of her life, it did take her almost two years to respond, but she did to each one. And some of the letters were great. She would get these letters back from kids and they would say, keep up the good work, Dr. Hogg, and things like that. She really just made such a wonderful impact on these kids. But Helen was a consummate educator. In January 1993, many years after retirement, Helen joined her colleague and friend, the late Dr. Robert Garrison, and other scientists from the University of Toronto in creating a film, Discovering Science, which was geared towards older elementary and middle school aged girls. One of the movie's final scenes features girls sitting at Helen's feet and listening to her talk about their pursuit of knowledge in general and science in particular. Not to know what's beyond is like spending your life in the cellar, being completely oblivious of all the wonderful things around us. Helen wanted to demonstrate that women have a place in science. Just days after completing this film on January 28, 1993, Helen passed away. Clearly, Helen's dedication to her field and to education never wavered. She reached a wide spectrum of people through her teaching, research, scholarship, and popular writing. However, she did not walk this road alone. Helen was informally initiated into the world of science by her parents. Doors were opened to her by Dr. Ann Young and Annie Jump Cannon. Helen was supported personally and professionally by her husband, Frank. And she developed as an astronomer under the leadership of Harlow Shapley, J.S. Plaskett, and C.A. Chant. Finally, Helen served in various leadership capacities of both the RESC and the AAVSO, and both remained important to her throughout her life. These organizations have supported women in science by electing them to positions of authority, by publishing their work, and by supporting them in efforts even beyond the immediate scope of the organizations. The RESC especially provided a foundation and a platform for Helen's life work and supported her as a scientist, scholar, and science writer. Thank you. <laughs>